Here is what Sir Thomas Newton, Bishop of Bristol, said about the Jews in the 18th century. The preservation of the Jews is really one of the most single and illustrious acts of divine providence. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless those who bless you, and curse those who curse you. If history and the story of the Jews has proven anything, it is that God has kept his covenant, his promise to the Jewish people. Here is a quote by Leon Tolstoy, the Russian writer, written in 1908. What is the Jew? What kind of unique creature is this whom all the rulers of all the nations of the world have disgraced, crushed, expelled, destroyed, persecuted, burned and drowned, and who, despite the anger and fury of their oppressors, continues to live and to flourish? The Jew is the symbol of eternity. He is the one who, following the faithfulness of his ancestors, has for so long had guarded the prophetic message and transmitted it to all mankind. A people such as this can never disappear. Writing about the Jews in 1899, Mark Twain observed that the Egyptian, the Babylonian, and the Persian rose, filled the planet with sound and splendor, then faded to dream stuff and passed away. The Greek and the Roman followed and made a vast noise, and they are gone. Other people have sprung up and held their torch high for a time. But it burned out, and they sit in twilight now or have vanished. The Jew saw them all, beat them all, and is now what he always was, exhibiting no decadence, no infirmities of age, no weakening of his parts, no slowing of his energies, no dulling of his alert and aggressive mind. All things are mortal but the Jew. All other forces pass, but he remains. What is the secret of his immortality? None of the ancient civilizations that destroyed us exist. They're absolute ancient history. The only ancient history that is current news <laughs> is the Jewish people. It's just, it's, it defies all logic and all of nature. And not only are we physically alive carrying a name with no connection to us, we behave, we act, we put on the same tefillin that were put on from, from Mahar Sinai. We have the same tefillin that Moshe had. We have the same customs, the same language, the same values, the same Torah. When a world was running around in darkness, barbarians killing each other, and of course we have of course, remnants of those barbarians today killing each other, we were sitting down in court discussing what you have to do if you, if you find a lost object. I have to return it, how do I return it? You know, can I build a fence this high, block that guy's sunlight? Imagine, 3,000 years ago we were discussing if I'm allowed to block someone's sunlight if I want to build a wall or not. Talk about sensitivity. Talk about you know, the idea of the, the, the essence of what a human being can become, godlike. I'll throw one example from Moshe Rabbeinu. Think about this. In the time of redeeming the Jews from Egypt, the first plague that was sent upon the Egyptians was to turn the river into blood. And so what happened? When it came time to do that, that plague, that miracle, so who was supposed to do it? Who would you think? Moshe. The, 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 he's in charge over here. But Moshe did not, could not, strike the water and turn it into blood. You know why? Because the water helped him. Look at the level of sensitivity. We're talking about a crisis situation. The Jews have to get out of slavery. Moshe came to take them out. But what's more important is not to contradict these essential realities that when you're so close to God and so close to truth, you become one with the world. You become one with, with the essence of, of, of all of creation. You cannot physically pick up your hand and strike a water that helped you. Imagine how we treated human beings. Imagine. This is, this is Moshe, 3,000 some odd years ago. This is what is still alive today. The sensitivity of a, of a, of a godly man, a sage that walks in our times, in our generation, I'll take one story which is so crazy that people listening to this will think it's a lie. But it's not. Rav Moshe Feinstein, again Moshe, from Moshe to Moshe, another Moshe. Rav Moshe Feinstein was the God of Lador, was the, one of the greatest sages uh, of about 50 years ago. He was leaving from whatever event he was at, and one man was just so, he wanted to be helpful so much to, to God of Lador that he said, let me help you, I want to help you. And he ran to open the door for him to get in the car. 
And in haste, he closed the door, and it turns out that he closed the door on the hand of Rav Moshe Feinstein. So imagine, you have a 70, 80-year-old man with a, a car door slammed on his hand. He sat there quietly without making a sound and told the driver to politely pull away. And when they got out of sight of, of that man, he said, please stop the car for a second. And he opened the door, took out his hand that was bleeding. And the, the driver was beside himself. How, what are you doing? How, what happened? How could, how could you, why didn't you say something? He said, I couldn't bear the pain to know that I would have caused that man the harm that, that, that I would cause him mentally, emotionally, if he knew that he did this to me. And so he endured the pain until he was out of sight in order not to hurt that person. So let, let's bring all this back to Moshe. And again, his original behavior was that he was so sensitive and so appreciative that the water the, of the Nile River protected him, that he couldn't bring himself to, and again, he wasn't supposed to, strike it. That is not, that's not the right way to show and treat something that you benefited from, even if it's an inanimate object like water. Yet at the same time, we know that Moshe Rabbeinu, the kindest man that we can imagine, but a strong man, when it came time to protecting an innocent victim of Egyptian cruelty, you know, there's a famous story where one of the Egyptian taskmasters, taskmasters you know, decided that he wants to take advantage of a particular man's wife. She was a little bit overly friendly, she said hi too often to people, and that brought her attention to be noticed, and so all of a sudden this Egyptian that noticed this woman and decided that he has to have her, so he made up some excuse to make the, the, the Jewish man leave his home in the middle of the night. Then he slips in, and it's dark in those days, it's hard to see what's going on, and he actually rapes this man's wife. When the man comes home later and realizes that, that my wife was with somebody, and of course putting two and two together, realizing it was this Egyptian taskmaster, so the taskmaster, knowing that, he, that this man knows what he was, was done to him, now decides I have to kill him also because that type of behavior was, wasn't even appropriate for the Egyptian people of the time. It was, it was also inappropriate. And he was, he was concerned. So he said, I'll get rid of this man by killing him. Killing a Jew, of course, in those days was simple. Just kill another Jew. Like we know all through history in, in all of the different countries that unfortunately have taken their anger and frustration out on Jews. Just kill another Jew. Nobody will care. We'll say anything about it and, and it'll be case closed. So he tried to kill him, and in the act of his trying to kill and murder this innocent Jew, Moshe actually raised in the palace, the Egyptian palace, a person of, of stature in, in Egypt, a ruler in Egypt. He sees what's going on, he understands the injustice, he had a special divine perception of what's going on, so he understood what had happened to this man and his wife. He saw that this Egyptian now was trying to murder him, and he could not stand still in the face of this injustice, and he rose up, and killed him. Now we think that in the movies he rose up and he killed him by being strong and stabbing him, killing him with a rock, whatever. No, he used one of God's holy names to kill him. And this is a very important message. God is the ultimate of kindness. You can't do anything with God's permission, especially if God's helping you do it by using one of his holy names, if it wasn't absolutely an act of kindness and justice and truth. And so we see Moshe's act to kill this Egyptian was not only with God's agreement letting it happen, but helping and facilitating it happen through one of the divine holy names of God. Because why? By letting that Egyptian live, you're actually being cruel. You're actually facilitating and strengthening evil and terror by letting that man live. The, the, the honest and kind and loving, true thing to do, even though it must come in the package of murder, is to kill him. Because he's evil, and by killing him, you've made the world less evil. You've got one evil person out of this world, and that's a positive thing. And that's what we have to remember. Now let's look at Avraham. Again, the kindest man that ever lived. He was the father of nations. He loved everyone. He loved Ishmael. He loved Yitzchak. He loved everyone. And his love was unlimited. He fed people. He, his whole life was devoted to doing one thing and one thing only. Kindness. Loving kindness. He taught the whole world that kindness is the cure to the cancer of selfish behavior. He, he was the antithesis of the nation of Sodom that wanted to only take care of themselves. And they, they outlawed kind acts of charity and things like that. And Avram teaches, Avram teaches us that the actual MS, the truth of the creation of the world is all about love and kindness. The cure to all of the world's problems are love and kindness. If we could put those two things together and make them a part of our lives, then all of what we're seeing today in a destructive world full of evil, full of hate, full of murder, full of, full of a lot of darkness will all dissipate, will all disappear. So let's take a look at Avram for a moment, the kindest person that we can ever bring as an example of kindness. Let's see how he behaved when it was necessary to be tough and strong. So first of all, we know the famous story of 
Avram, when he did the actual Akedat Yitzchak, he was told to sacrifice his son, and that took a, a very much an inner strength to do. But that's one thing, that's one test. Yet we find the more important test in our context is when there was a war going on between the four and five kings, look it up in Genesis, the book of Bereshit, there were four kings fighting against five kings, and his nephew Lot was taken captive. And Avram did not stand still and say, oh, well, what are we going to do? Oh, well, he got up with a few of his, 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 his partners and, and, and a few people and went to fight a battle, a war against these nations, many nations and many people. Why? To free Lot, who didn't deserve to be captive. And there were many captives involved there that didn't deserve to be captive. They took many, many civilians captive in this war, the four kings against the five. And it says that Avram was tremendously successful. He had miraculous divine assistance. The man of kindness that used his hands, both his hands, only to feed and to care for and to take care of, only for acts of loving kindness, was now using his hands to fight and kill. Because if you don't defend justice and truth and people that need help when they need help with that type of strength, then you're not being overly kind. You're being overly cruel. And that's why we see even Abraham, Avraham, the father of kindness, going to war, fighting with, 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 with a strength that was unparalleled and being victorious and saving everybody. And so here we come full circle. The Jews, we've been around. We're the only ancient people still around. We know that the ultimate truth and foundation of this world is kindness. And we try to emulate God and his wonderful, beautiful attributes. Patience, kindness, love, giving. That's it. That's the essence of what it's all about. But since there are evil people out there and are evil things that can happen to us, we must also balance that with strength courage, fearless acting when necessary in the face of evil and destroying evil, killing an evil person. It's an act of love and kindness to all of his future victims that are saved. And so kindness in the wrong place is cruelty. And that's what we also learn. And now we have to know not to be ashamed. A Jew, the people of Avraham and the, the people of Hashem, God's chosen people, cannot be afraid to be strong and defend ourselves, especially in this desperate times, dangerous times right now, we must stand strong. Love on one side and strength on the other. And that will bring us the proper respect and that will preserve and save our own lives and many other lives to come. But we can't end with negativity. I mean, the point of, 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 of creation and of, of us being here and what we have to go through isn't so that this ends with an atomic bomb that destroys the world. We're not here to destroy the world. We're here to fix the world. And so the question is really, what is the solution? So I will, I will tell you what I think the only solution is. And I will quote, or attempt to quote, Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr. Right? He, he said, darkness cannot conquer darkness. Only light can do that. Okay. You know, that's a very profound statement. Now, he's a great person. He was a great person, and he deserves his holiday. It's not quite Hanukkah, but he deserves his holiday, Martin Luther King Day. Um, but he's, he's really echoing what the sages have said generations before. I mean, King Solomon says that there's an advantage that, of the light that comes from darkness. Beautiful idea. And another idea is that a little bit of light disperses a lot of darkness. And so he's giving his twist on that and saying that you can't fight darkness with darkness. You can only fight darkness with light. The truth is that ultimately he's not 100% correct with the statement because in the end of the day, you have to, and this is Kabbalistic, the ultimate way to fight the darkness is from the darkness. And so he's not... You know, he wasn't a sage, he wasn't a Kabbalist, but he was a great man. It's a beautiful saying, but in truth, it's not true that you can't fight darkness with darkness. You have to fight darkness from the darkness and bring out a light that's greater because of it. That's, that's the real approach, Kabbalah. But again, I love the quote. So what do we, where do we go from here? What do we do now? And so it, nothing has changed. With October 7th, with the Holocaust, with the Greeks, nothing, the Romans, with, nothing has ever changed. Why not? Because it's the same job that we have from day one. God made a world with light and darkness. And the job of life and creation and of every human being out there, whether you are from whatever nationality, whatever, whatever religion, as long as you believe in God, it is to add light and decrease the darkness. And when we're done that, we'll have our beautiful, perfect world that we've been dreaming and waiting for. It's to add light. Our job is to add light. And I'll show you a visual, visual way to appreciate this. We experience night. Every night it's a... We look at the sky and it's dark, black, a black sky. And something begins to happen approaching dawn. Approaching dawn is like the darkest before the dawn, this expression, is when there's the least light in the sky, right before dawn. And suddenly there's a, a ray of light, a ray of hope that pierces the horizon. 
a ray of light. That ray of light, we can't even see it. Why can't we see it? That ray of light knows it's shining, but we can't see it. Keep in mind these details. And then another ray of light comes, and another. And slowly but surely they gather together, these rays of light, the break of dawn, and they break the darkness. They conquer the darkness. And we start to see light build. And slowly, slowly it gets stronger and stronger and it dissipates and vanquishes that darkness. And there's no more darkness because when the sun rises, there is no room for darkness. That first ray of light is the first action you take to spread your light. You know you did it, or at least tried, which in God's world is like doing it on some level. You know you've tried to add light. You know you've tried to add goodness. And if you've succeeded, you know it. But the ripple effect of that one good deed has yet to shine for the masses to see and appreciate. And so the beginning stages of rebuilding is hard, difficult, and sometimes dirty. When you go to a construction site, they have a picture of this wonderful, beautiful palace that's going to be there at the end. But when you go there too early, all you see is a big mess because the b building of something beautiful has its messy stage. And so this shining of light, in the beginning, it doesn't, it doesn't shine. We don't see the light yet. But when more and more actions come together and the ripple effect of one good action continues and they all gather together, then the light starts to make an impact on the darkness. And we can see between the darkness and the light. But it's still vague because these are still beginning stages. What we're essentially trying to do is tear out the good from within a dark, evil world. And that is, that is not easy. Somewhere out there in these places where we, where we think that they're, 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 there's no hope, there's never no hope. Hope is never lost. There is hope. And I'll tell you how I know. I'm not a prophet yet. I'll tell you how I know. The end result of this entire process of creation and life is going to reach a point where there will be world peace. The prophet, Zephania, Zephania, he says it. In the end of all this, we will all come together as one united people, each nation in their own place, with their own fashion. Don't, I don't want to put on the jalabi. I like my suit. Each one will have his own place, and there'll be universe, uh, diversity within unity, unity within diversity. There'll be unity within diversity. We will each respect and unite with each other, and each will have his own place and identity, and we will live in peace forever, and accept that we are all sharing space in God's world. We are all visitors, and we will respect the other visitors, and we will certainly respect and, and give proper honor and, and, and obedience to the, 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 the Balabai, the owner of this house, Hashem. That's the end result. So if that's the end result, so we, have to, we know where we have to go. So if I know where I am and I know where I go, just draw a straight line in between. You add your light. You add your goodness. You be different. Don't be afraid to, to be different. Don't follow the crowd that are walking off a cliff to destruction. You choose a path of building and of construction. And it's hard. It's the harder path. It's harder in the beginning, but in the end it pays off tremendous rewards and dividends. That's the path of the Jewish nation. That's why we're here. We're still building. We still have hope, and we will never go away. We are the only ancient people that are making the current 2023 headlines because we live by those things that I just mentioned. We, are, we, we live, we survive, we thrive, and we are all about ultimately trying to do the right thing. Well, no one's perfect, but we are. We defend ourselves. We don't attack. Okay? So may we be successful, Vezat Hashem, each one in his own way, to, to, to banish this darkness of the current war and of, of all war, forever, with the idea of, of real peace in the world when we rise to that occasion and make the peace. Make the peace, first of all, with your neighbor, and second of all, with the entire world.